happening tonight in Vancouver. Next year is going to be the busiest year we've seen probably in our lifetimes in terms of the volume of events and concerts and festivals. The borders opening to travelers again means big business for BC's event organizers and a lot of fun on the horizon for everyone. There are thousands out there needing homes. Animal shelters are nearing capacity in BC and due to wildfires, emergency spaces are desperately needed. The SPCA is now asking for the public's help and is also offering something in return. We should be uh, making Luke, Luke uh, an honorary life member of our club because we're just uh, we're really excited to see um, somebody take the first step and, uh, and, and, and come out as gay. The National Hockey League now has its first openly gay player. The Pro Cops announcement has many in the LGBTQ community celebrating, but also noting that more work needs to be done. This is City News Everywhere. On September 7th, we intend to allow entry for fully vaccinated travelers from any country for non-essential traveler. Travelers will have to be fully vaccinated with a Health Canada authorized vaccine at least 14 days prior to entering the country. After over a year of being closed to non-essential travel, the federal government says Canada will be ready to start accepting non-essential international travelers soon. While the rest of the world waits till September, Americans who are fully vaccinated can start arriving on August 9th in just three weeks. Also, as of August 9th, the three-night government-authorized hotel stay requirement will be eliminated for all air travelers. <laughs> Travelers will now be able to go directly to their quarantine location to complete their 14-day quarantine. But the openings aren't without restrictions. Travelers will still need to plan a 14-day quarantine and be ready to be tested during those two weeks. Visiting Americans will also need to provide their vaccine record through the ArriveCan app and pass a pre-arrival COVID-19 molecular test. However, there's still no word yet on when America will return the favor. Um, I spoke last Friday to Secretary Mayorkas, the uh, Secretary of, of Department of Homeland Security, Security. Uh, we discussed and I, I revealed to him the measures that Canada would be implementing at our border. Um, he indicated to me at this time they've not yet made a decision. Um, they, they anticipate their current measures will likely be rolled over on, on July 21st. There's also some clarity on families with kids under 12. As vaccines haven't been approved for that age bracket, unvaccinated kids can skip quarantine. This means they can accompany their parent or guardian out of the house to their destination, so long as they avoid group settings like summer camps, school, or child care for 14 days. Also in August, five more airports will be allowed to start landing international flights. Halifax, Quebec City, Ottawa, Winnipeg, and Edmonton. Now, of course, this only applies to people who are fully vaccinated with a Health Canada-approved vaccine. While the federal government says this news will come as a big boost to international students coming to Canada for the fall semester, there's no word yet on when Canada will start accepting people who have received vaccines like Sputnik or Sinovac, which are approved by the WHO, but not Canada. In Ottawa, Shaoli Lee, City News. Get ready to see a lot more of this and go to a lot more of these. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be, there's going to be an incredible amount of stuff going on. We needed this. It's full speed ahead, planning concerts, conventions and big events again for local producers. Now that Canada is set to soon welcome fully vaccinated travelers for fun. For the last 18 months, we've had no ground rules and we didn't know where we stood. We're starting to understand that footing and this is just another great step. Big events like the Vancouver International Car Show he produces take time. He says it will be a marathon to be ready by March after cancelling the past two years. We really need to have our, our engines running and tires spinning in September to get everything uh, off the ground. Same for the celebration of light. Organizer Paul Runnels says events and concerts will come in a trickle, not a boom. It's not going to instantly turn on the lights and we're suddenly going to see a million shows going on. And large-scale international conventions, more challenging, so could take years to come back. Because opening the borders is just one step. When you're doing an international conference, there are a lot of things that have to come into place. People have to feel very at ease that things are going to go turnkey once they get there. And that they'll be able to get back home again after. So this fall, expect local events and Canadian performers on national tours. But then, hold on to your hat.
next year is going to be the busiest year we've seen probably in our lifetimes in terms of the volume of events and concerts and festivals and things like that that have been waiting and biding their time to be able to come back. For City News in Victoria, I'm News 1130's Lisa Usta. There were some scary moments for a woman in downtown Vancouver early yesterday morning. Police say a 29-year-old woman was walking in the area of Davie and Mainland Streets at around 1 o'clock in the morning when she was approached by a man in a white SUV. He asked if she wanted a ride and after she declined, she was pushed to the ground and suffered a bad leg injury. Investigators haven't identified any suspects yet. Crews are investigating an early morning fire at a church in Surrey. Flames broke out at the St. George Coptic Orthodox Church in Wally at about 3.30 this morning. Police say it was a target of attempted arson just a few days ago. Surveillance video from last Wednesday shows a woman leaving the area after lighting something on fire at the door of the church. That fire caused some small damage. Obviously, we're going to be looking at both of these incidents very closely. If there is any evidence to suggest they're related, we'll be going where the evidence shows us to go. But at this opportunity, we are just asking for anyone with information on either of these two incidents to please call Surrey RCMP or Crime Stoppers. RCMP are searching for a heavyset Caucasian woman who was wearing a black hoodie. They also say there are no immediate links between today's suspicious fire and the one last week. There's been a targeted shooting outside a pub in Surrey, and the RCMP is now looking for witnesses. Officers were called out just after 1 o'clock this morning to reports of an injured man under the Patello Bridge. He had gunshot wounds and was taken to hospital with potentially life-threatening injuries. RCMP believe he was shot near the Brownsville pub on Old Yale Road and 119th. The victim is known to police. A 26-year-old man has been arrested and charged after a violent confrontation in the West End on Sunday morning. Police were called to the Shoppers Drug Mart on Davie Street near Thurlow after a security guard was stabbed several times while trying to detain a shoplifter. The suspect took off, but police were able to track him down at a building in the downtown east side last night. The security guard is still in hospital with serious injuries, but it's hoped he'll make a full recovery. Animal shelters across BC are filling up fast. Many pets need shelter as devastating wildfires tear through parts of the province. The SPCA is cutting adoption fees in half with the hopes that these animals can find a safe space and a forever home. Free up some space um, for the wildfires. Bear and Sparkle were sent to the Vancouver SPCA from the interior of BC to make space in shelters for animals that are now homeless due to wildfires. You know, we think of the people and the trauma they're going through, possibly being evacuated or even losing their home and everything and their animals, all they have left. So it, it, it weighs heavily on us and we want to help every animal we possibly can and we want to help them get reunited with their owners. Many pets are in temporary care until displaced families can find pet friendly accommodation. But some animals have been found and have not been claimed by anyone. Last week, animal protection officer Alex J was driving through Lytton when he was flagged down by a homeowner who found a cat. The cat had given birth in his home, likely during the peak of the devastating wildfire that destroyed most of the town. She set up a little base on the guy's balcony. Really a lot of behind a lot of uh, uh, furniture and just stuff on the guy's balcony. And you could tell it was she did her best to keep herself and her babies um, fighting. You could definitely tell she was a fighter. Mama wasn't letting anything happen. And she made sure of that. The cat and her seven kittens are now being taken care of by a foster parent with the SBCA. In order for the SBCA to accommodate an influx of animals, it's cutting adoption fees for dogs, cats, rabbits, guinea pigs, and other small animals starting Tuesday. We're always worried about capacity. That's always at the top of our minds. So yes, we are getting filled up quickly, but we try never to go over capacity because we have to do what's right for the animal and make sure all the welfare needs are met.
Many animal shelters across the province say they're being stretched to their limit right now. BC's Cat Therapy and Rescue in Mission is responsible for coordinating the fostering of more than 300 cats. It's had to temporarily stop accepting any new animals. We're really hoping that adoptions will pick up foster homes will pick up. Um, perhaps people understand the importance of spay and neuter so that maybe next year it's not so bad. You know, there is never a shortage of animals needing homes. There is no reason to breed, you know, your cat or anything like that because trust me, there are thousands out there needing homes. SPCA adoption fees will be 50% off until July 30th. In Vancouver, Ashley Burr, City News. More than half of eligible British Columbians are now fully vaccinated against COVID-19. The latest figures from the Ministry of Health show 53.2% of people 12 and older have had their second shot. 156 new cases of the virus have been detected since Friday. 40 of those cases are in the last day. And two more people have died. 49 people are currently in hospital with the virus. 12 are in intensive care. Visitor restrictions on long-term care homes in B.C. are lifting as of today. For the first time since March of last year, you'll be able to see loved ones without booking an appointment. And if you're fully vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. There are no longer limits on how many people can visit or how long you can stay. If you don't have both doses yet, masks are still required. It's a historic day in the National Hockey League. A prospect for the Nashville Predators has become the first player under contract to publicly say he's gay. Luke Prokop had made the announcement on a social media Monday morning, saying that living his authentic life will bring his whole self to the rink. It's cliche, but I get to be free. You know, there's, it felt like there was a 100-pound anvil or weights just holding me down. Speaking to our sister station Sportsnet, the NBA Edmonton-born defenseman said he didn't know how others were going to react. But in his initial post, the 19-year-old wrote, I am no longer scared to hide who I am. I got to a point in time where I was like, okay, it doesn't matter anymore. I have so many people who I believe are going to love and support me no matter what. He was right. The support online was overwhelming. One person tweeting, gay kids who love hockey now know there's a place for them in the NHL and that is everything. Another writing, what incredible courage and a new role model for so many. But there is still so many barriers young hockey players face, says Chris Wells, Canada's research chair in sexual and gender minority youth issues saying family income, where they live, color of their skin and their sexuality all continue to be roadblocks for youth and their dream to play in the NHL. Important day, it gives us a glimmer of hope about the future that uh, is yet to come, but it also reminds us of the important work uh, that needs to happen to support people like Luke and the many others. For Pro Cop, He's hopeful his coming out leads to lasting change in hockey, saying the support he's received from the hockey world, including his new team, the Nashville Predators, is something he's never felt before. And I can just be myself. I don't have to worry about who knows who doesn't. I can focus on getting stronger. I can focus on getting faster. Stuff like that just will make me a better hockey player, and I felt I've become a better person as well. No other active NHL player has ever come out as openly gay. In Edmonton, Rochelle Sufi, City News. It's certainly come a long way since uh, since 25 years ago. It was a it was a really quite a, quite a revolutionary thing to, to have a, a gay men's hockey team 25 years ago. Luke Prokop has become the first player signed to an NHL contract to come out as gay. LGBTQ advocates are hopeful the sporting world has turned a corner, but they also say there is still plenty of room for improvement when it comes to representation in professional sports. Um, the fact that it's that this is the first person to come out gay and that is a, that it is a, such a big announcement is speaks to the fact that that we need we need to we need to do more. Peter Lipscomb is president of the Cutting Edge Hockey Team in Vancouver. Players are part of the LGBTQ community. That locker room talk, offhand comments that you don't think about, but that that really kind of can can dig deep and, and hit deep when. Uh, 
when you when you're kind of, when you're a closet individual or when you're not when you're not comfortable in your own skin. Sports still carry painful memories for some in the LGBTQ community, according to Andrea Arnault with the Vancouver Pride Society. We had an event um, called Picnic in the Park, and we changed it to Pride Sports Day because we had a lot of the sports organizations come and like do activities, and we actually had a lot of feedback from the community that changing the name to Pride Sports Day was challenging for them because they just avoided sports when they were young people because it was so traumatic for them. There are also certain kinds of sports that can create challenges. Tommy Chu plays golf recreationally. He is part of Vancouver's LGBTQ community. And so it's almost every time you go play, it's like, do you want to come out to that stranger or not? Um, so, and, and, you know, I do have people that I play with, but uh, uh, it would be nice to play with people that's in your own community so you don't have to come out every time and be more comfortable. He hopes to one day see a similar announcement in the world of pro golf. There's like about 150 so PGA Tour players. So, I mean, statistically speaking, I think there's, there's you know, I think that they will come at some point. And coming up and showing support to queer sports leagues or queer organizations um, is hugely important because other people see that, you know, and hopefully by example, uh, will eventually follow with acceptance. For now, Lipscomb says he's looking forward to a more accepting future in the world of sports. For people like me and my club for, who are who are LGBT members and also for, for, other, for other people who, who May not who may not be, be comfortable saying that out loud, but uh, but now feel more comfortable and, and are getting closer to that. In Vancouver, Rio Renouf, City News. Two athletes will be sharing the honor of carrying the Canadian flag into the stadium for the opening ceremony of the Tokyo Olympics. Miranda Iam of London, Ontario, and Nathan Hirayama from Richmond, BC. Iam is appearing in her third straight Olympics, representing Canada in women's basketball. Hirayama will be making his Olympic debut as co-captain of our men's rugby team. Both say it will be an honor to represent the country, even in the midst of a global pandemic. This past year and a half has demanded a high level of teamwork and Canadians from coast to coast to coast stepped up and demonstrated togetherness, resilience and solidarity. And that is why I am so proud to carry the flag for you. It will be um, a different a different opening ceremonies. Um, especially for those who've been to prior um, games like Miranda and, and some of her teammates. Um, but I still think it's going to be such a special event. The Olympic torch relay continues in Tokyo, a city under a state of emergency due to a recent spike in COVID-19 cases. Several athletes have already tested positive, including at least two who were staying in the Olympic Village. But organizers insist the housing and venues are safe. What we're seeing is what we expected to see, essentially. You know, if I thought all the tests that we did were going to be negative, then I wouldn't bother doing the tests in the first place. We do the tests because they are a way of filtering out people who might be developing an infection, who might become a risk later. So we identify them early, we take them apart from other people, and we manage them and look after them, and we look after the contacts. Fans won't be allowed inside Olympic venues, and athletes will also have their movements restricted in an attempt to prevent the spread of the virus. It looks like Green Party leader Annamie Paul will not be facing a non-confidence vote from, from party members, at least not for now. Party executives saying today they will put off a vote until the next general meeting and leave Paul in place until an expected federal election is called sometime this year. Internal arguments have held the Greens back for months, including party executives withholding funds from the leader's campaign to win her Toronto Centre Street. Yeah, it's definitely uh, an emotional time for everybody. Montreal Canadiens goalie Carey Price usually lets his play on the ice speak for him. And Price with a big stop off Coleman. But the 33-year-old is taking time out from a family trip to Kelowna, B.C. to talk to Jeff Rahoman from 680 News about how the discovery of mass graves outside former residential schools have affected him and his family. His mother is chief of the Elgacho First Nation. My grandmother went to a residential school and you know my mom is still really 
know about the stories that she's told us about uh, about their experiences, and you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's challenging for for a lot of people because it uh, had a snowball effect on 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 the generations following those students. So, um, you know, I just think that we just need to do a better job in the future of. Uh, of recognizing that this is part of our of our history in Canada and, and just understanding that it's just not right. In June, before Game 2 against the Winnipeg Jets in the second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs, Price stopped to meet with residential school survivor Jerry Shingus outside a cathedral just a block away from the arena where he was getting ready to play that night. She wasn't there to meet with NHL players, but to speak to the Archbishop. Price sharing his personal story with her. The goaltender saying, we need to do a better job of recognizing this part of Canada's history. You know, I don't think a lot of people were even aware of what a residential school even was. I don't think uh, you know that history, that part of our history in Canada was is not covered very well. So I just think recognition of that and you know obviously reconciliation is uh, is a big part of it. In Montreal, Alicia Rubertucci, City News.